Okay, I just hit record for I think the fifth time and I've been pissing around for minute upon minute trying to fucking get this intro out of the way. I don't like this intro, all right? I don't like it. I was revising the script and I kind of thought this is the shittest part and I don't want the shittest part to be at the beginning, obviously. And though I felt like I was easing you into it like a true gentleman, a supreme gentleman, some might say, that isn't worth the boredom it will take to get to the good stuff. So whilst the payoff would be worth it, one hopes, um, you know, no one's interested in that anymore. Um, maybe I'll put a timestamp here if you just want to jump straight in, but bear in mind some of it might not make sense. So get out of your head, get out of your fucking head. This is stupid. Okay, let's go. Incel. Incel is a word that I believe gets thrown around a little bit too much nowadays to the point where its definition and intent is made significant within the mind of the person saying it. So it's for them and them alone and reserved for them and maybe their social circle, if indeed they have one, which one would assume they don't given the ever-increasing rise of loneliness in this dystopian hellscape we now call home. Yes, that was okay. What's the next bit? Originally, the word was a portmanteau of involuntary celibate, and it was coined by a Canadian queer woman, if I'm not mistaken, called Alana, and she put up this blog called Alana's Involuntary Celibate Project which was apparently to, for people to try and, you know, just give voice to their stories, maybe not feel so alone with it all, but it's a pretty odd fucking title for, a, you know, for that kind of thing, because making it a project makes it sound like she was campaigning for involuntary celibacy, which doesn't, you know, it's a paradox. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, whatever. And yeah, apparently Alana stopped bothering with it once the website started getting her laid, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, which maybe that's what Elliot Rogers should have done. But yeah, Alana abandoned it after that and only came back once she'd f filled her mouth with carpet and pretty much accused angry men, I think, quote, of stealing her word and weaponizing it <clears throat> because women. But yeah, I mean, this all comes down to sex, doesn't it? Pretty much like everything else. It's, it's all about sex, baby. So let's talk about it. And death. Can't go forgetting about death now, can we? Also known as the little death, La petite moi is a French expression that the English use, but the French have never fucking heard of, which is quite common amongst French expressions in the English language. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I, I, I have no idea. That's just like one of those weird things. Or at least that was according to Quora. Like a few people were on there going like, I've never heard this fucking expression. But the little death is referring to the orgasm. In literary circles, it can sometimes mean like transcendence and stuff, but yeah, for the sake and purposes of this vid, it's just talking about busting a nut. Um, but why death, you might wonder? Because during the climactic moment, you are, for the briefest of seconds if you're a dude, relieved of your consciousness. So in, in a way, as you're ejaculating or are just about to, it's like a, yeah, you're snapping out of consciousness for a second or three or maybe five if you're very lucky or it's been, an, <laughs> you've been on NoFap for, for two years, I don't know. Um, it's kind of similar to a sneeze, I guess, but hopefully a lot, lot messier, at least for her on her face. But still, why death, you know? Um, I think it's because 
The little death or orgasm is quite often followed by the post-nut blues, which is also known as post-coital tristesse or dysmorphia. Post-nut depression, basically. Um, if you're a dude, you're already familiar with this, that dank wave of depression that hits shortly after busting. The brief respite from consciousness achieved within the orgasm is kind of like the ghost you've been chasing, while the depression that follows is realizing that you're nothing but a slave to your biological conditioning. Schopenhauer called it the devil's laughter. <laughs> the very thing that drove you to the hub X videos or Vorsch's naughty folder <laughs> disappears the moment reality and your mortal place within it returns as you sit there with your pants around your ankles staring at the empty protoplasm as it bleeds into yet another sorry, sorry Kleenex. Probably the most accurate mirror you'll ever look into before closing the first of an unspeakable amount of tabs, like catapulting yourself down a stepping stone path of ultimate humiliation and shame, a little bit like Jesus forced to carry the cross. Speaking of corn, if you're a young man, listen up and listen true. The reason I'm going to bring up some pretty vague concepts and metaphorical impressions is because a lot of the problems men face today are related to the spiritual above all else, or the complete lack of it. Today, even when it comes to, say, tech, all mysticism and mystery has been thoroughly eradicated. Before, a cassette player had a unique function. It did one thing and one thing only. That gave it a value and unique quality by definition. Nowadays, everything has been enabled inside one device. And whilst that's great and everything, the value of each and every function the separate tech once had has now been reduced and robbed of its unique purpose. And it's the same thing with pornography. In days of yonder, it had a special treat kind of quality reserved for behind the counter shelves and the odd videotape that dudes shared amongst each other, which was pretty gay, but whatever. It wasn't meant to be readily available 24 seven with access to all it has to offer and then some. There's probably more alternating styles of porn uploaded every single day than the average lifespan of a human being could ever hope to consume. You need to think of your go-to corn as your favorite food, say vanilla ice cream or Big Macs or what the fuck ever. Now let's say you've got unlimited access to eat as much Hagen dazs or Mackey D's as you want. Not just your favorite one, but everything they have to offer, even the limited edition shit and classic flavors of way back when. After a while, that juicy big titty Big Mac isn't gonna satisfy as it once did. You'll inevitably start to chow down on flavors you're not even partial to, just to get a taste of the novelty that the original Big Mac once came with. You'll even start gorging on shit you don't even like or want just to get that flavor of new. Studies show that straight dudes will jack it to gay porn and gay dudes will fap to straight shit despite it going against their very sexuality just to get off. Now I'm not sure if that's chasing the novelty or the taboo, but I guess both since other rabbit holes can lead to brutal rape fantasy, s and or as we now know, lolly. It's like the sense of the taboo when you first encounter porn intertwined with your arousal will eventually become so embedded in your psyche that the only way to get it back is to turn the taboo on yourself. Anyway, I didn't think I'd be waffling on about porn as much in this video, but the point is this. Just because you have unlimited access doesn't mean you should allow yourself unlimited access. Like with tech of old, you should ascribe corn a value of your own design. Respect it, knowing, 
and in spite of the fact that it has no respect for you. Personally, I'd leave it the fuck alone in as complete a capacity as possible. If you succeed in doing this, tell me how. And yeah, if you're further intrigued by this section, I would recommend A Billion Wicked Thoughts and Your Brain on Porn, which is basically what I'm regurgitating here. Instead of wanking yourselves homo inside the rabbit hole of the hub, or butthole, maybe I should say, a lot of you boys really need to start reading. It's not even difficult to get a list of material either. Just look at whatever they refuse to teach at universities nowadays and hey presto, there's your reading material. Yeah! Woo! Because throughout history, men have been warning other men about the catastrophic allure of the femme fatale. From Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth down to even Gillian Flynn's Amy Dunn, the femme fatale has always riddled the pages of literature before we even had pens and paper to write it on. Even that don't worry darling garbage was basically a retelling of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where a woman wakes up in paradise alongside a man who has no choice but to be faithful to her with everything she could ever need at her disposal, only to decide, hmm, yeah, it's not enough though, is it? Eve probably looked at Adam and his missing rib and decided he was genetically inferior and that she'd rather rot in the real world working 80 hour weeks trying to save the lives of people who ate too many cheeseburgers and ignore the man who loves her until he becomes just like the bottle of soy in their larder where, lost and alone, exiled inside his very own home, He'll go on to later confuse the voice of Jordan Peterson with that of God. Jesus. The femme fatale, however, isn't really about women at all, with one exception. Mother Nature and her psychotic drive to perpetuate herself no matter the cost. It's symbolic of the blind allure incited in all of us as men, tapping into our vice-hungry, self-destructive sides. As the name suggests, you're attracted to her because you know she's going to kill you, the same way your own nature's eating you alive. Within the dichotomy between a master and his slave, a sub and their dom, or bottom and their top, and contrary to appearance, it is the submissive role that has the power and not the domineering one. This is something feminists, if not all women of today, either outright deny or love to play dumb regarding. They always have and always will be in control of the sexual domain. Like that meme that did the rounds a while back, that isn't a vision of the future. It's a depiction of how it's always fucking been. The dumbest thing feminists ever did was propose that women need to free themselves sexually and empower their bodies by essentially acting the way men could only ever dream of doing. The sexual liberation from slut walks to treating sex work as real work is nothing but an exercise of futility, a never ending much ado about nothing celebrating a sovereignty they were granted at birth all because they can grant birth and nothing more. Don't believe me? Just look at strip clubs. From the outside looking in, it appears as if it's a male dominated and catered for domain. But really, the woman herself, even when totally outnumbered, is held up on a literal pedestal, thrown more doubloon and free shit than Jesus Christ himself could ever hope for, and is worshipped as if she's a goddess just for being what she is. <laughs> Men are perpetually whipped by the pussy, regardless of any and all situations they attempt to entrap women in. And deep down, we fucking know it. That's enough to make anyone just a teeny little bit resentful, wouldn't you say? A bitter cell, perhaps. 
The reason you probably never see femme fatale figures in modern movies is because in the online realm, they're a scroll a fucking dozen. Never mind strip clubs, the equivalent nowadays can be found not only on OnlyFans, but whatever social media platform takes their fancy. Instead of being able to catch a whiff of a woman, dudes will happily sit at a desk pretending that a DM they paid for, no less, was written by the girl they worship instead of some fucking stupid AI chatbot. I remember when I was younger, hearing a guy describe porn stars, strippers, prostitutes, whatever, as not being like real people. I think that's a healthier way to view thoughts in general. We're always told to treat all women as having value, etc. But let's be real, a whore is a whore. If you don't set your own boundary, nobody else will. You're better off dehumanizing them than viewing them as actual women. And why not? When all they see you as, if they ever have to see you at all, is nothing but a dollar sign or another set of eyeballs to feast upon. Once again, the femme fatale is the warning sign. I wouldn't even blame those women anyway. Most of them are just psychopaths trying to earn a buck. The internet itself is the femme fatale of our times. Utilizing your interests and, most importantly, your insecurities to make you feel as shitty about yourself as possible to exploit whatever money you may or most likely don't have. The internet, like the femme fatale, has no morals. The problem many a man faces today is the complete lack of morality that's out there. So you need to come up with your own. Thoughts are not people you'd ever want to have in your real life, for you never know when they might just turn around, stab you in the back and leave you for literal dead. Dehumanize them, for they never saw you as a man in the fucking first place. If you must entertain their existence, do so in mind that they're not really a person. They're more bot than human anyway nowadays, so it should be pretty easy. So we've covered la petite moi and la femme fatale. I suppose it's about time we went down on the vagina dentata. <laughs> the vagina dentata. Much like the femme fatale, throughout history, in all cultures, all over the world, the myth of the toothed vagina has been prevalent since time immemorial. From South Africa to India, South America to New Zealand, the pussy with teeth has always lurked. In Chile, there's a saying, a woman of striking appearance has a biting vagina. In Japan, a Shinto tale recounts how a demon hid teeth in a damsel's vagina. She unwittingly castrates two grooms on their wedding nights before taking action and asking a blacksmith to fashion a metal dildo that successfully defeats the fangs. The iron phallus she used is even enshrined in Kawasaki where they hold a penis... <laughs> where they hold a penis festival every year. Hookers pray and leave offerings to the cock in hope of it preventing them from getting STDs. <laughs> I'm not joking, uh, this actually just, it does exist. And in England, there was actually a genuine case of the tooth vagina when a dermoid cyst grew inside the cavity of some poor woman's hole, now in a museum for all the world to see. Trusted to be a British woman who literally grew teeth inside her puss, am I right? <laughs> The point of these myths, however, is this. As a man, you must remember, every vagina comes with a set of teeth and each one's gonna take its own bite out of you. You enter her in all your glory as a man, strong, determined, veins are pumping, blood flowing, ready for action, only to be subsumed and eaten alive like a Venus fucking flytrap 
until you're completely drained and utterly depleted of your life source. Then you're exiled from the Holy Land once again, consumed and spat out, left nothing but flaccid and useless, just like when you were born. For the tooth vagina is really no myth at all. Like everything, the relationship between sex and death plagues a man for a lifetime, until Mother Nature, having chewed and masticated upon you during your every waking hour, swallows you up for good. Life is often described as a series of letting go, a perpetual state of grief and mourning over the impermanence of everything. But really, letting go is like the Disney version of life's brutality. Symbolically, the psychosis of Mother Nature is no better represented than through the act of sex. We are forever gaslighted by our own biological imperative. The tiny death at the end of it all, the brief respite from consciousness, nothing but a reminder of not only the briefness of your existence, but also how the very nature that bred you is feasting on you too. Life isn't a series of letting go, it's a process of being eaten alive. I guess I could be accused of demonstrating attributes of having the Madonna whore complex with all the shit I've been waffling on about, which, simplified, is usually defined as a man struggling to view the woman he loves, often a pure and innocent mother figure, as being sexually desirable the longer he's with her. Nowadays, especially, this is likely further embedded via pornography and social media, where the gamification of dating and selling of sex has turned it into nothing but a vice and commodity to be bought. It's representative of sex, but it isn't sex itself. Se that's, a that's a tough one. It's representative of sex, but it isn't sex itself. Really though, the Madonna whore complex is a dichotomy born out of our origins, surely. When a man enters the vagina, he go- <laughs> I don't know what that is. When a man enters the vagina, he's going back into the womb. Having had a mother who nurtured and cared for him without the sexual element, one would hope, can potentially create a conflict of interest in his future outlook. This duality of mind, porn, advertisements, and Instagram posts notwithstanding, is something each man must reconcile and find equilibrium with himself. It's often quoted that sex is all about power, but if power corrupts, what is to be done with it once it's granted or gained? In the manosphere, they often claim that the alpha male stereotype will bring out the feminine side of the woman, where she essentially succumbs and displays signs more akin to a child than being a woman. But, well, whatever gets your rocks off, I guess. This dynamic just plays too heavily into the submission fantasy men mistakenly believe their masculinity can grant. Really, the goal is surely for the man to bring out the more masculine side of the woman and the woman the more feminine side of the man. It isn't the improvement of your more dominant side, but the surrender of it. Sex isn't about power, really. It's about androgyny. That's probably for another video. Unfortunately, as we are all way too aware, a woman in today's world is a hard thing to find. I guess in the same way that it's always been mummies, baby, daddies, maybe, it all comes down to a question of faith. You've just got to believe that's the only thing. Although I would actually argue that that gives a man a right nowadays to demand a paternity test because we have the scientific capability to do so. And there's not really any excuse not to do that. <laughs> children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. 
Our Great Depression is our lives. The spiritual crisis is probably no better demonstrated than within the copium headquarters of the NoFap community. The idea that a woman can smell the retention on you is one of the most ludicrous examples of magical thinking I think I've ever fucking heard. If anything, a woman notices you more when you've been getting laid far more than when you haven't been. Whether you've been fucking choking the chicken or not, Women are competitive with each other, dipshit, not with you. When you see shit like, man, I've been on NoFap for a month, and brother, it's like having superpowers. I got my confidence back, I can move things with my fucking mind, and one of these days, I reckon I'll be able to fly. <laughs> the copium levels are off the fucking charts. Oh, mommy, 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 mommy loves you. Baby wants to fuck. Oh, 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 get ready to fuck, you fuckers, fucker, you fucker. Oh, hey, oh. Don't you fucking look at me. Obviously, it's a good thing to have better concentration, focus and drive and whatnot. But all these claims really prove is you've watched way too much porn. <laughs> That's why you're feeling more confident, because you stop letting the hub go totally foobar on your sorry fucking ass. And that's that's good. I'm not going to shit on that. Just stop saying dumb shit like it's manifested some miracle <laughs> or you've uncovered the holy grail you haven't done shit motherfucker you've just stopped watching porn you've just discovered discipline and abstinence from what you should have known was a vice all along i mean in fairness just like simon cow or fucking mcdonald's the hub got its hands on you most likely when you were just a wee little happy meal ripe and ready for the taking. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Don't fuck with me. It's not your fault. Don't fuck with me, all right? Don't fuck with me, Sean, not you. It's not your fault. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, I'm so sorry! <laughs> 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 Gerbert Johnson, good old Gerby Gerb, greatest rapper and philosopher of our times, was really onto something when he was harking on about how we've always had religion. And throughout all cultures of human history, deities were always present. And he made a strong correlation between self-help gym bro gurus and the need for religion in the human mind. For you can take man out of the religion, but you cannot take religion out of the man. Man is myth, forever mythologizing. Our need for a higher truth, power or being goes beyond the idea of God even. Just take a look at the most popular storytelling trope of the hero's journey. Forget main character syndrome. The hero's journey is so akin to the religious ideal that it should really be called the Prophet's Journey. Ilaha 
Even throughout a lot of prophet origin stories, there's usually a moment where our Messiah takes a time out, aka the moment of crisis in storytelling terms, to go and reflect and reevaluate alone in a cave or desert normally, voluntarily abandoning everything, including and first and foremost, himself. The problem nowadays is we get this the wrong way round. Instead of venturing out into the world, we start off by rotting in the caves of our lonely bedrooms, waiting for the moment of crisis to come to us. Interestingly enough though, I think the yearning for something more, that religious further, will find you either way, because that's just the nature of our lives. As an atheist, I'm not going to say you need some Jesus in your life, but as a storytelling species, you pretty much do. You don't have to read the Bible or Quran, but you know, when it comes to the human experience, you're not going to find any better texts out there. If you want something more applicable, go for stuff that's been written in the last couple of hundred years, but it all amounts to pretty much the same thing. Like I mentioned earlier with tech, having everything enabled within one device is great for convenience, but makes the value of each capability somewhat redundant. It certainly devalues it anyway. Convenience should be looked at with an air of caution. If something's easily obtained, it's also easily dismissed. Unfortunately, the rise of smartphones hasn't just obliterated the unique quality of singular technologies, but has also wreaked havoc on a societal scale too. When I was a kid, for instance, going to the video store was an experience in of itself. Not to wax too lyrical on the fucking member berries or nothing, but the ritual of taking the trip down there scanning through the different genres and having to make a choice, knowing it could be good, bad, or even worse, dull, came with a whole host of life lessons that you just don't get anymore. One, you learn quickly that life isn't always gonna give you what you want. Two, just cause something looks good doesn't mean that it necessarily is. Three, sometimes for the sake of others, you'll have to make compromises and sacrifices. Four, the store owner is entrusting you to bring the tape back in good condition, making you responsible for it. And five, other people might be waiting for it while it's in your hands, so you best return it in good time. You don't own it. Everyone and no one does. In a sense, the ritual of renting a videotape inadvertently had its own story to teach you. I mean, I guess you could get the same kind of feeling from a library card, but why bother with that when you can just download PDFs? Anyway, that's not the point I was trying to make. <laughs> anyway, now that I've clearly proved why every man is an incel, I guess the bigger point or question is what to do about it. Well, first and foremost, I wouldn't really give a shit because <laughs> it's just a fucking label. But when I've been harking on about the spiritual, I guess what I really mean is that you need to use, care for and nurture your own imagination. And whether that's through obtaining knowledge or utilizing your creativity, is totally up to you. In the meantime, be careful what you deify and most importantly, learn how to perform cunnilingus. If you're going to worship women, you could at least learn how to do it fucking properly. If you ever are lucky enough to do so. This is a really weird ending. <laughs> Coping and see
jumping so high. Jumping in ceiling. If you call it involuntary celibacy, but then a project, I mean, even those two words, involuntary celibate, it's, it's putting a sense of entitlement on it by definition. So to then go on and accuse young men of being entitled to sex, it's like, yeah, but you, <laughs> you've already set up that dynamic, you know? It's like, well, yeah, of course they're going to think that. It's it's literally in the... Never mind, I'm not here to just give definitions of certain phrases and whatnot. I want to move into the good stuff, so...